As uh, the very polite gentleman announced over the loudspeaker, my name is Mike Girardi. I'm from Aria Systems, and I'm here today to present Mastering Your Markets in a Digital Age. All right, so now as I was walking up down the aisle here to do this presentation, I realized two things. Number one, that that title could pretty much apply to every person, thing, and, and kiosk that we have here at this Cloud Expo. All right, very nebulous title. I'll get down to the point very quickly. And number two, this is called the Demo Theater. All right? I don't have a demo to show, so if you're planning to see a very <laughs> there you go, get <laughs> if you're planning to see a demo about mastering your markets in a digital age, prepare to be profoundly disappointed. Uh, we do have people at our booth, the Aria booth, that has a product, and we can show it to you. But today, I'm talking very high-level concepts about what it means to master your markets in the digital age, as it refers to recurring revenue or subscription-based business models. All right, so I'm going to drive to the point very quickly in that regard. Um, so, getting into this, what exactly are we defining as the new nor normal in the uh, recurring revenue subscription age? It's really all about disruption. So, you talk about companies like Uber, like Netflix, like Roku, Airbnb. You're talking about companies that have taken a thing or right, a product and changed the way that people consume it. Um, you look at companies like Adobe, Verizon, Pitney Bowes, Audi, who are all customers of Aria. These are legacy companies that have you know, uh, legacy product lines and legacy systems that are deciding to change the way that people can consume these, these services, or actually take a product and make it you know, less of a transactional type product and more of a service. Um, so all of these things are innovations that are all around the same types of uh, offers. And all of these things have common themes. So you look at a Netflix, you look at a Roku, you're talking about a recurring service. You're talking about access to something, and innovations must also always be delivered as it relates to those access. You're always tethered to the end customer, so it's less about the transaction and more about the relationship. Um, you're talking about usage and subscription models. So I'm going to talk about Audi in a little bit. Audi is taking the concept of Zipcar and applying it to their fleet of vehicles. And when you take an Audi out on their Audi on demand type app, you're getting charged by the mile for exactly what you use. We're starting to get conditioned as consumers to get what you want and pay for what you use. Um, so all that stuff is, is related to usage models. Um, time to market urgency, everyone is trying to get this stuff out very quickly. I don't know if you guys have seen recently all the Gillette ads about subscribing to their razors. I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, I always felt very frustrated by going to the, to the you know, drugstore and having those razors behind the locks, right? Along comes Dollar Shave Club. Now you can subscribe $5 a month and get exactly what you know, Gillette offers. Gillette is and should be very worried about that because just like Netflix did to Blockbuster, an erosion of a core product line based on a service that is conveniently and more cost effectively delivered to the consumer is something that every company should be worried about. Okay? And we're talking about on demand, anytime, anywhere, in any way the customer wants it. Right, so the configuration of products and getting things differently based on knowledge of your consumer, based on the relationship that you have, is what we're talking about here and what ARIA enables. All right, so that's what we call the new normal. Now, recurring revenue is really, is our founder, who wrote the original ARIA system, hates the concept quote to cash. All right, and that's how everyone looks at how you bill someone. Right, whether you're a B2C model and you, you have your price on a website and somebody just buys it, or your B2B model who's using Salesforce, CRM, to drive customers into become accounts, the idea of quote to cash is somewhat antiquated as it relates to recurring revenue or subscription models because it implies a definitive start date and a definitive end date. All right, now let's take uh, another example that is fresh on my mind, Starbucks, okay, so coffee. Um, how many, a quick question, all right, you, the winner gets, uh, what, what do we have at the booth, Mara, pens? Okay, so the winner gets a pen at the ARIA booth. Uh, when was Starbucks founded? Anyone have an idea? Year? 71. All right, Mar, there you go. All right, so for the last, what, 43 years, Starbucks has built every system around one thing, driving people into the stores and having them pay for what they buy, a transaction. But technically, when I leave Starbucks, as soon as I leave the store, I'm no longer a customer of theirs until I walk back in the store and do another purchase. So the concept of everyone doing, going to Starbucks or everyone going to any sort of consumer store is the transaction. And every system has been designed to process that thing, that transaction. Now, let's say, all right, and Starbucks is starting to hint at this, 
that instead of driving a transaction, I'm going to drive a relationship with my customer. And that relationship means I'm going to pay 25 bucks a month, and that 25 bucks a month gets me 10 cups of coffee and a cup of breakfast sandwiches. Now I'm consuming, and I'm going to Starbucks every day because I pass Dunkin' Donuts, Panera Bread, Starbucks, and 20 other coffee places. But if I'm suddenly subscribing to Starbucks and getting cost efficiencies by doing so, then I'm going to go there every day for my coffee. And what does Starbucks gain by that? They gain knowledge of what I do. They know that on Mondays I like a red eye with a, you know, a shot of espresso. But then on Fridays maybe I'm dropping the, you know, the iced coffee. All right, so they start to understand my buying patterns and therefore can tailor what they offer to me in a way that maximizes my customer experience. So the concept of quote to cash as it relates to recurring revenue models goes away completely because it's a constant iterative cycle of understanding my customer and delivering to them an experience that keeps them my customer. So retention now becomes the goal. All right? So the retention for us, I mean, you know, increased customer knowledge, increased satisfaction, and minimizing churn. I want to keep that person, again, using my Starbucks analogy, I want them to keep them coming to Starbucks. So therefore, I'm going to do all of these things right, and the bill, all right, for us in terms of a recurring revenue model is the most frequent touch point that you have with your customer if you want to keep them as an in a relationship. So all of this is the goal of what you're doing. Truly understanding your customer, maintaining that satisfaction is the end goal of this recurring revenue world. So, you know, knowing thy customer, what does this all mean? I mean, you can apply this to any type of business, right? You talk about Zipcar, you talk about Starbucks, you talk about VMware, Adobe, Audi, all these customers that are using Aria. Um, you're looking at different pieces that ultimately make up your customer, right? So who they are, what they do, how they buy, when they buy. Um, all this stuff right now is very siloed in enterprise companies, right? You look at one system that does account management, another system that does product catalog management, another system that actually does the invoicing. I mean, you've probably felt it in your lives when you call someone for a support ticket and they have no idea who you are or what you're about, right? I've been a customer of you for X amount of years and you're treating me like you, you, know, you don't even know who I am and what I'm all about. That, that, that feels bad, right? And therefore, I am apt when the offer comes to me to leave you, right? If you have a good sense of who your customer is, then you have a better chance of retaining them and upselling them down the road. So how does that happen? How do you actually increase customer satisfaction? I mean, all this stuff is very wonky type billing terms, but at the end of the day, think about it in terms of, let's take a Netflix example, or a Roku example, or something where you're actually consuming media. So I'm a customer, I sign up for Netflix. I sign up for the silver plan, which gets me X, Y, and Z, okay? As soon as I pay for that, I should have access to that, right? I should be able to log on and use my service that I've just procured. You'd be surprised how many companies, large, huge, billion dollar Fortune 500 companies, have swivel chair type processes as it relates to people signing up for a service and actually getting access. So the correct and accurate provisioning is key to that first experience of me getting and buying your service. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I start doing what I do in Netflix. I start watching my shows, right? I look at things, or the new shows that are coming, the movies, and you, you know if you use Netflix how that works. Now, based on the shows that I have watched, I get stuff offered to me, right? Based on the coffee I consume, I get stuff offered to me. I mean, that's key as it relates to driving that relationship. And then effective handling of inbound requests. Like I mentioned before, if we are, if we want to have a relationship customer and consumer, I'm sorry, you know, you know, company and consumer, then we're always kind of circling each other and asking, are you valuable to me? You know, I mean, Comcast has been in the news a lot recently as it relates to that. You know, the customer service associated with people calling in with problems. Um, you know, everyone's always asking them, you know, Comcast, are you valuable to me or am I going to cut the cord? And Comcast, you know, conversely, is looking down at the customers and saying, which customers are the most valuable to me and which ones do I want to consume and keep? So that is all the road to customer satisfaction as it relates to recurring revenue models. Um, and really, I mean, a big key to this is that consumption data. So whether or not you're actually doing a recurring revenue model based on consumption, like the Audi model I'm going to explain in a moment, which is by the mile, um, you know, it's very valuable information to have, and, and this is a commodity, right? Consumption data of how people are using your service is something that's available. You just need to feed it to the right spot. So think about it, you know, in terms of, let's say I want to launch, it, launch a new coffee service, okay? <laughs> I'm just using, I'm, I'm riffing on this coffee as a service thing, even though it's not actually real yet. Um, 
you know, I'm going to launch this and I'm going to say I'm going to charge you 20 bucks a month. I'm going to want to know how much, even if I offer unlimited cups of coffee for 20 bucks a month, I'm going to want to have an idea of how much co coffee people are actually consuming. Therefore, I can make better choices down the road on how I may, may, maybe want to meter this. It's 20 cups for 20 bucks and everything above that is 50 cents a cup, right? I mean, that's very important. No matter what your business, understanding how people use your system, whether or not you're billing for usage or not, is extremely important. So that's when we get to this concept of don't just bill, monetize. Now, monetize is one of those words that sort of rubs me the wrong way, sort of scratch down my ears a little bit, because everyone uses it in a different way. The, w the way we think about monetize is how are you taking something that everyone already consumes and changing the way people consume it, okay? So if you think about like a typical billing world, all right, um, I purchase a service, I get invoiced for a service, or my credit card is processed. That's the standard world of a bill, right, or of a, a transaction as it relates to the monetization of a service. But when you enter into the recurring revenue world, this becomes so much more complex, right? And what happens in between the bills is where value is ultimately derived in a system like ARIA. So uh, let's, you know, again, let's use the coffee thing. We'll keep going on this, right? So I'm, I'm on my standard bronze plan. I get 20, 20 cups of coffee a month. You know, but my credit card's about to expire. I need to understand that. The system needs to automatically know that this, my credit card's about to expire. I need to go into the user self-service and you know, re-update my credit card information or else I am going to not get my coffee the next time I go through the drive-thru. All right, or I decide I'm going to upgrade to the sandwich plan where I get five sandwiches a month, all right? In the middle of the cycle, what happens then? How is it prorated? How is revenue recognized? There's a thousand different things that can happen in the recurring revenue relationship between the bills. And mastery of those is really where customer satisfaction comes into play. All right? So, obviously, all right, Aria is, some, is a company that manages these types of very complex enterprise-grade recurring revenue relationships for companies. So we are an end-to-end -end monetization platform for very large recurring revenue models. Um, we have done things in, in multiple industries. So I'm going to go into a couple use cases right now. When we first began as an organization, it was all Silicon Valley as a service type companies. You know, brand new offerings, things coming out, but you know, very quickly, based on the cautionary tale of Netflix and Blockbuster, you know, large organizations started looking at recurring revenue models as the next frontier. They really needed to get here, they really needed to get there quickly. So um, what we do is really across industry, and then I'll go into a couple of use cases real quick. So I've mentioned this already, Audi. All right, so everyone knows who Audi is, obviously. Um, what they're doing is really disrupting the, 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 not only the luxury car market, but the car market in general. And I guess you can sort of kind of put Tesla in the same world, although they haven't quite gotten where Audi has gotten yet as it relates to how they consume. They're you know, something that we all know how to consume, which is a car. All right, so Audi first began with a beta type uh, deployment of this in San Francisco of Audi on demand. You download an app, and you put your credit card in there, and you stand on the quarter and say, I need an Audi, you press the button. And up comes a guy in a slim fit suit driving an, driving an Audi, drops it off for you, and he walks away, you take the car, they charge you by the mile, okay? That's the first generation, that's what they're doing, and they're rolling that out in all major cities. The next generation is Audi at home, all right? So the idea is, if you live in a high-end condo community, or a high-end condo complex, they're going to put five Audis in the basement. And as a result of you actually joining that condo, a perk would be that you'd be able to subscribe to the ability to rent out or take out an Audi and schedule it at your convenience. So instead of having to buy a car in the city, you now have an Audi at your disposal. Take it out when you want, schedule it, charge it by the mile. And then the third you know, generation is something that I think all of the car companies are thinking about right now, which is a lifestyle lease. All right, so a lifestyle lease isn't a buy. It isn't a lease. It is a subscription. You're subscribing to a flight of experience, right? So I'm going to subscribe to the highest flight of Audi, and in the summer, I'm going to be driving the convertible, and then when the, when the winter rolls around, I drive onto the lot and I drive off with the SUV. So instead of having a car, you have an experience of a, of a car, and you can swap those in and out as they see fit. So this is changing the entire dealership model. It's changing everything, and it really is causing everyone to stand up and take notice. Aria is the enabling technology behind that. Right? It wasn't that Audi couldn't do this, it's just they couldn't bill for it. Right? So Aria came to the, 
came to Audi and we, we established this partnership, and we're the driving force of enabling the monetization of that. VMware is another example, you know, traditional software company that does perpetual license type software, okay? Um, Aria got in with VMware very early, started doing some very small point projects, very quickly became what they call their subscription delivery platform. So like Adobe, you know, VMware is also taking this journey of moving things from perpetual license to subscription. One at a time, one at a time. This is a massive business transformation that they're undergoing that not only includes the ability to bill for these things through subscribers and through value-added resellers, but um, also create all of the contract vehicles associated with it. So a very big undertaking that we are help enabling. Another very cool one that goes to the Internet of Things play that this conference is all about is Philips Healthcare. So Philips Healthcare came to us understanding that they essentially sold out the market for their giant MRI machines. So each one of these machines costs, what, $10 million? There's only so many hospitals in the United States or the world that can afford that. So they sold them all out, and they said, okay, now what do we do with this? We have more MRI machines to sell. So they decided to go down market to regional hospitals and said, instead of paying us $10 million, we're going to charge you less, and we're going to charge you by the scan. So every hospital that uses this gets an invoice every month for how many MRIs that they've done. Again, completely changing the medical device field, and there's many more applications to this that we're exploring right now. And then finally, Roku. Okay, so Roku, again, from a things perspective, is a classic model of you buy a thing at Best Buy, you take it home, and you sub activate your subscription to that. And actually, within that subscription, you have many other subscriptions as well. You know, you've got Hulu, you've got Netflix, you've got X amount of things that are now coming to market that are associated with this device. So Ari, again, is the enabling technology, billing technology underneath Roku. Um, and, you know, again, from, from a complexity perspective and a volume perspective, you know, they're talking about 8,500 different combinations of pricing plans, packages, et cetera, to deliver all this content that can be delivered from, you know, core distributors. So that's Aria. That's some of the you know, innovations that we help enable. And again, you know, the word billing, monetization, et cetera, that's all well and good. My eyes start to glaze over when we start talking about those things. What really excites me is the innovations that we help enable by allowing companies to take a core technology, core product, and uh, monetize it in a different way. So thank you for your attention. Enjoy the show.